speaking of gifts, that's a gift right there. Wow, to God be the glory. Yes, sir. You know, I, may, I, 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 did, I forgot to announce something that's happening next week that I, I think I, I want to just toss out there. It's in your program. October the 23rd, we are going to have a tailgate party right out here. It's a different kind of tailgate party. <laughs> But it's going to be a great time in the Lord, and just make sure you look at that in your program. Thank you, Tom. What a blessing that song was. My goodness gracious. Folks, I, I told him um, earlier that, you know, we kind of had a time restraint in the first service because we had to break for Bible studies. But I said, that second service, you can just go. We don't have another service until 6 o'clock tonight. So, you know, he's all fired up playing today. So let me just say that it is such an honor for me to introduce this man. And I could go through his resume and it would take quite a long time to get through it. But he has been the vice president of the uh, North American uh, uh, Board of, of uh, what must, uh, Missions. Yes, thank you. Missions Board and for seven years served as vice president there. He's also been a pastor uh, globally, actually. He pastored in Belgium, England, other areas. Uh, he has been uh, a great advisor for many, uh, including us. He is an author, and he has been the president of my cherished alma mater for the last 10 years. And uh, I was saying this morning that, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm in, so in love with this seminary that uh, because of what he has put in place from uh, a professor's standpoint, the professors there at this seminary are incredible. And some of you know that because you've gone with us over there and kind of done the tours and, and talked to them and been part of that. And I told, I told uh, our congregation this morning that I'll probably be a student until I'm 90 years old and just fall over because I'm so in love with the way the professors pour their hearts into their student body. And I truly believe with all my heart it's because of this man's passion to bring those kind of professors to the institution. It is an honor, a privilege to call you my friend, my friend. I want to introduce Dr. Philip Roberts. in the word of the Lord this morning from Mark's Gospel, chapter 10. And it's a wonderful honor and privilege to be with you today. Two people, I love more than Vicki and Ron. So thankful for the fabulous ministry they're having here. I grew up in a church planner's home, and so I understand about the dynamics. There's nothing more exciting in all the world than being part of a young, growing church that preaches the gospel, points people to Christ. And, uh, spiritually needy part of the world. So uh, God bless you. We love you doing things we can to help you. And we're excited to be part of this time. I'm glad you said what you did about the time. And that really helps me. I, I, told, I told the first congregation that he told me to be finished approximately 40 past the hour, 45 past the hour. But he didn't say which hour. So, uh, you know, but I, I assumed it was 9 o'clock. So uh, we got out on time. And I, I can't help but think about the, those famous words of the famous Kansas Cityan, Harry S. Truman. I share this with a lot of churches wherever I go and preach. Harry S. Truman, President of the United States, said once he had never heard a sermon that he didn't get something out of but that he'd had some close calls. Yeah. <laughs> when I'm done this morning, if I say that was a close call, I, said, well, I, I hope not. But I, I agree, agree with the Western Baptist Seminary and the Western Baptist College up in Kansas City, Missouri. We hope you come and visit us anytime you're up there in our neck of the woods. Just take X one seat off of Interstate 29 and come up there and visit us, see our new chapel. We're blessed to uh, serve God there. We've got a fully accredited program, undergrad and graduate level, offer anything from an associate's degree through a PhD, all fully certified by the North Central Association Higher Learning Commission. 
And we have an online program to say, well, I have time to go up there. Well, you can study in the comfort of your own home with your pajamas on. If you like it, it's our online program. And among other degrees, we have a Master of Arts in Theological Studies, uh, which you might want to avail yourself the opportunity to use. But uh, come and see us. Uh, we have a beautiful new chapel going up, 1,000 seats, 40,000 square feet, the conference center. And we've had about two to three million dollars worth of sweat equity go into that facility with uh, the help of volunteers from across America. And we don't owe a nickel on on that property. About 85% finished. So pray for us when we get there all the way. And our goal is to take it home. And uh, if I die tomorrow, or when we finish that chapel, and sometimes I think it's killing me. <laughs> but uh, at any rate, I can pass it on to the next guy without any burden or any concern to, uh, to them. So we praise God for it. And we love Gary and Arlene Cream for what they do for the cause of Christ. Helping Midwestern days around a long term, a uh, long time friend. In fact, I and I wear this little wedding band here, largely due to her and her sweet departed husband, Willie Drummond, who's one of my great mentors, do their great matchmaking skills. <laughs> That's it, right there. And uh, my sweet wife, I met in Warsaw, Poland. We married there in the summer of 1980. All my family, I'm the only one, by the way, made in the USA. <laughs> Anya was born and raised in Poland. Our daughter was born while we were in Oxford, England. Our son while we were at Pastor International Baptist Church in Brussels, Belgium. He's our Brussels sprout. <laughs> <laughs> I'm the only one made in the USA. <laughs> I'm honored to be here. Let's have a word of prayer together. Father, we pray your blessings on the preaching, the hearing, and the living of your word. Speak to anyone's heart today. Draw them to yourself, to the miraculous, wonderful work of the Holy Spirit. Anyone here today who's outside of your love, care, and salvation in Jesus Christ, may today they give their all to Him. To all of those of us who own Him and know Him as Lord, may we be refocused on living day by day dying to self and living to Christ. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. One of the things I try to do in my life is memorize scripture. And uh, I like to memorize passages that I preach from. So see how I do. Mark's Gospel, chapter 10. Now that's cheating. Don't <laughs> 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 look at it. Cheating. <laughs> Wait, this is a familiar story for you. Perhaps the, the story of the rich young ruler, verse 17 of Mark's Gospel. We, we read these words there, verse 17. Now as he, as Jesus, was going out on the road, one came running and knelt before him and said, Good teacher, what shall I do that I may inherit eternal life? And Jesus answered and said to him, Why do you call me good? There's one who is good, and that is God. You know the commandments. Do not commit adultery. Do, do not murder. Do not steal. Do not bear false witness. Honor your father and mother. Claim it. Do not bear false witness. Do not defraud. Honor your father and your mother. And he answered and said to him, All these things I have kept for my youth. And Jesus, looking at him, loved him, said, One thing you lack, go sell all that you have and give it to the poor. And you shall have treasure in heaven. And come, take up the cross and follow me. And on hearing these words, he was very sad and went away sorry, for he had great possessions. Now, if there's any differences in what you saw and what I put, it's because they had a different translation. <laughs> <laughs> if I was greatness, I'd give myself an A. <laughs> it was called the most popular game show in American primetime television history. And the name of the program was Who Wants to Be a Millionaire? Mm -hmm. Real hot for that. Have you ever 
ever saw that program? Who wants to be a millionaire? You know the answer to the question, don't you? Who wants to be a millionaire? Regis Philbin. He hosted it. He hosted it and he made about a quarter of a million dollars every episode. But very interesting program. You win the hot seat, you get a chance to answer 15 multiple choice questions, beginning with the most simple, going to the most difficult. And every time you got a correct answer, you doubled your money, starting at $25 or whatever it was, all the way up to 15. You got that answer correct, you won a million dollars. It's multiple choice. And usually, the key moment in every program was when a contestant was struggling with an answer, wasn't quite sure which answer it was, and they'd come up with one, and then Regis would lean forward in his chair, and he'd ask this question. Is that your final answer? And that's what I would have liked to have asked the rich man. Is that your final answer? Because the rich man had a similar set of circumstances. He had a very important question. In fact, I would call it life's most important question. Why should I do that? I may inherit eternal life. And he had an opportunity to get an answer to it and to respond to it. And we discover, as we look at this story, some parallels between him and the television show. Why? Because he made some good choices here. He made some correct uh, decisions and went down the right path in so many dimensions and senses of the word. And then at the very end, he made the wrong call and, if you will, it seems lost it all. So what I'd like for us to do this morning is simply look at the right and correct choices he made. We'll think about those for a few moments and then we'll look at... That disaster final choice he made. And we want to do this not for the sense of understanding of some kind of academic exercise or simply for the, the mental exercise of it, but we want to do it for a spiritual reason. And that is some of you here today may be in that exact circumstance. You may be at a crossroads making an answer and giving a response to the person. Jesus Christ. And I hope today, if you are, you'll make the right answer and get the right response. All right, well, let's think for a few moments. You can keep your Bibles open. We'll look at some of this and you can follow along. But let's notice number one, he had a very important question, didn't he? And with that question, he went to the right person with that question. Who did he go to? Jesus. He went to the Lord Jesus Christ. Now can you think of a better person to give you an answer to that question? Here was the incarnate Son of God, born of a virgin, full of the wisdom of God. The Bible says, in Him all of the wisdom of God dwell. Here was the one who lived a perfect life, tempted like you and I are, yet without sin. Here was the one who went to the cross for our sins and died in our place. Here's the one who was raised from the dead. Here's the one who is at the right hand of God Himself to receive any of us today who come by faith to Him and in Him to be received of God. So in a very real sense, Jesus just didn't have the answer to that question. Jesus was the answer. What an amazing choice, and what a great choice, what a correct choice it was for the rich man to take that question to Jesus. Now, my question for us is, uh, before we move off this point, is why would he go to Jesus? Jesus hadn't yet died, he hadn't been raised. What was it that drew the rich man to Jesus at this point in time in his life? Well, I think there's a couple things, and one of them is pretty obvious. Because in his first encounter with Jesus, what did he call him? He called him good teacher. good teacher or good rabbi, which is what the word teacher means in the Hebrew language. Because Jesus had an amazing and I think the greatest reputation of all time as the greatest teacher of all time. The book of Mark describes his teaching in this way. It says... 
the common people heard him gladly. He could draw and hold the attention of thousands of people, not just for a few hours, but for several days. He could take common illustrations out of the life and background and agricultural setting of his day and from other illustrations in the world of nature and the circumstances of life and make important spiritual principles and applications out of them and, and did that so much so and did it in such an interesting fashion that folks would sit as I said, not for hours, but for days to listen to him. Now, you know, if I go too much longer this morning, you know, some of you folks are going to be doing this. <laughs> your stomach's going to start growling. You're going to be thinking, where are we going for lunch? What are we having for lunch? And your mind's going to be somewhere else. And, and you know, being raised and growing up in a Baptist home and President of Baptist Seminary, we always say, wherever there's two or three Baptists, there's a potluck dinner around. <laughs> I, I know, I know how the, they, that crowd that sat for two or three days listening to Jesus without eating, they weren't Baptists. <laughs> they were not Baptists, I guarantee you. They had another faith, I guarantee you. But, but on one occasion, John 6, they sat there for a couple days. They hadn't been prepared to, they didn't even bring food with them. But they were so enthralled and captivated by the teaching of Jesus, they forgot about eating. And you remember what Jesus did? He took the load of the fishes, multiplied it, fed them so that they wouldn't, wouldn't clap on the way home due to malnourishment. And here's the other thing about the teaching of Jesus. That he didn't dwell on the small stuff of life. It wasn't an infomercial, you know, how to get this special duster that can clean all the cobwebs out of the corner or something like that, or I can spray all this stuff and float a screen door on the lake. I don't know who would want to float a screen door anyway. I'm like, whoever thought of repairing a boat bob with a screen door, but you know, this guy's spraying the, the tube on the screen door, and this is how you repair your boat and all this kind of, yeah, right, okay. Well, that's not what Jesus taught on. Jesus taught on the big issues of life and of eternal life. Who is God? How do we know God? How do we have the assurance of salvation? What is life all about now? Even so that when some of his disciples betrayed him, uh, he turned to the twelve and he said, Are you going to go away too? You remember what they said back? They said, Lord, where are we going to go? Because you have the words of life. So his teaching was so empowered with the spirit and power of God that it was as if hearing them was to have life itself. And, and here's another thing about his teaching. Every once in a while he'd do a miracle as an object lesson for his, his teaching and sermon after. Now I'll tell you what, if professors up here at KU can do that, they're going to have a lot of folks signed for their class. If you can just start your class period with a little miracle, then you're dead person. You know, a lot of folks are going to sign up for that class. Well, that's the way Jesus did it. Because we discover in John 6, he multiplied the loaves and fishes, gave them all a good lunch before sending them home. But before he sent them home, he had a little sermon. I am the bread of life. He went on to explain that the giving of his life was spiritual bread for all those who partake of it so that you can have eternal spiritual life through him. Nine, John 9, he uh, makes the blind man see and he wants people to understand that he just didn't come to give physical sight to one or two folks. He came to give spiritual sight and spiritual insight and the light of life to those who would see Him as Lord and Savior. John 11, He raises Lazarus from the dead. And He uses that a little springboard for a little teaching, a little preaching. And He makes it clear that He is the resurrection and the life. And whoever believes, puts their faith and their trust in Him will have eternal life forever and ever. Because... So it's no doubt, there's no doubt in our mind why the rich man came to Jesus. He understood who 
Jesus was, he understood what a great teacher he was, and he understood that Jesus had the answer to this question. Number two, though, let's notice this. Not only did he come to the right person, he went in the right way. Because in verse 17, it describes for us how Jesus was approached by this man, how he came to him. What does it say? Now as he was going out on the road, one came running. Running. Now isn't that interesting? Why is that interesting? Well, in Jesus' day, rich men didn't run. Rich men didn't break sweat. Rich men did not physically exert themselves. Rich men did not perspire and do physical labor or physical exercise. Why is that? The reason for that is they had somebody to do it for them. So if a rich man wanted to talk to someone, he would take servant A and he'd say, servant A, go out there and find Jesus, tell him I want to see him and bring him. That's how a rich man normally would handle that assignment. But that's not what he did. The rich man said, you know, I'm going to go find Jesus. No email, no phones in that day. Probably the grapevine got it to him that Jesus was in town. So he was energized enough about the fact that Jesus was around. He dropped whatever he was doing. He took that coat and that cloak. He hiked it, hitched it up or tied it up in the knot, girding up his loins, and he took off sprinting. Don't you know that, that little village of town where it was was amazing when they see the rich man come running down the road. <laughs> Is this Kansas City Marathon or what we got going on here? He comes running down the road to Jesus. Now what's that tell us about? That tells us about his spiritual interests. Here was a guy who was a complete success in this world. He had great possessions. He had it made in this life. But he was concerned about the life to come. Smart man. He knew it would be very foolish to be a big success in this life and to miss heaven and to end up in hell. He didn't want that to happen. He wanted to have success in this life. He wanted to have success in the life to come. He was thinking about eternity. That is smart. So he didn't want this opportunity to pass before he had a chance to ask Jesus this question. He ran to Jesus. How about you? What about your spiritual priorities? Is this an answer you want to have? How bad do you want it? You want it today? You're willing to find out? You're willing to dig? You're willing to listen? You're willing to respond to God's invitation to give you an answer? that question? Rich man wanted an answer. He came running. Let's note something else about it. What happened when he got to Jesus? He knelt before him. Very smart. Now that's something else a rich man usually didn't do, by the way. Rich men usually didn't kneel in front of folks. Rich men had folks kneel in front of them. Rich man, he was the bank of the day. You know, there was the first national bank in Jerusalem. Aren't we glad? Uh, the rich men were the lenders of the day. The rich men were the foundations of the day. The rich men were the ones who did favors for people. And if you want a rich man to help you with a loan or give you a gift or forgive a debt, you came in their presence, bowing, scraping, married, maybe bearing gifts, and you would kneel in front of them. So rich men were used to having people kneel in front, in front of them. They were not used to kneeling before people. But when this guy got to Jesus, what did he do? He knelt in his presence. Here's the other point. Maybe the Holy Spirit had already convicted him. This is the Messiah. This is the Lord. This is a manual. This is God in the flesh. So he not only kneels in front of him, what you would do in front of deity, a person you thought was divine, 
He asked him a question only God could answer, and he called him good, and Jesus pointed that out. Why do you call me good? Only one is good, and that's God. So the point there is, maybe he already had a good... Now here's the point for us, folks. The Bible tells us, one day, every knee will bow, and every tongue will confess Amen. that Jesus Christ is Lord. Now let me tell you who's going to be in that crowd. Every politician... Every member of royalty of every nation and every clan or tribe across the history of the world, every religious leader, Muhammad's going to be in that crowd, Muhammad Gandhi's going to be in that crowd, the Buddha's going to be in that crowd, Joseph Smith's going to be in that crowd. They will kneel before Jesus and confess him to be. Amen. Every knee, no exclusions. The big issue for us is. You can do it here and now by faith and trust in Christ receiving the forgiveness of all of our sins. Or, unfortunately for many who say no to Jesus, when they bow that knee, it will not be to their salvation, it will be to their condemnation. If they said no to Christ in this life. He came running, he knelt. Now let me ask you this question. Where did this happen? Out on the road. He came running out on the road. In other words, it's out in public. It's like going down the middle of Lawrence today. There's Jesus walking. This guy comes running, full dead speed, and falls to his knees out in Main Street before Jesus Christ. That's very interesting. Because we know that a lot of people came to Jesus, like Nicodemus, John chapter 3. And when did Nicodemus come to Jesus? At night, under the cover of darkness. Let me just tell you, in the first century world, when it got dark, it was dark. Just try that with no electricity. And all you have is basically oil lamps and, and wood fires and that kind of thing. I, folks, it was dark, so you know it was even hard, hard to recognize a face from a few feet away. And so, coming at night was never a threat. Most folks were not going to rape. That's why they had to pay Judas, you know, to pray to Jesus so they made sure they got the right person while it was still dark out. No flashlights. Or as the Greeks say, no torches. But the, the point is, he had to point Jesus uh, out, uh, Judas did, because of the darkness. But this is a broad daylight. This is so everybody in town and every person would know and every person was going to see this rich man kneeling before a carpenter's son from Nazareth and asking him a question only God could answer. Amazing. Amazing. And that tells us something too about what it means to follow Jesus. Jesus said, if you confess me before men, I will confess you before my Father. However, if you deny me before men, I will deny you before my Father who is in heaven. So the open public profession of faith is very important. God doesn't have a secret service. He wants us openly, publicly to confess our faith. That's why baptism is in order when you trust Jesus. That's the coming out ceremony. That's the open public ceremony of really saying for the first time, I'm following trust in Jesus as my Lord and Savior. Went to the right person. Went the right way. Number three, ask the right question. What was the question? What shall I do, or what must I do, that I may have eternal life? Good question. Now let's just say you and I didn't know anything what the Bible taught, or any other religion taught about salvation, and you had the chance to ask God one question. What would you ask? This would be the question I'd ask, and I want to know, Lord, what is it I have to do in order to know that when I die, I'll go to be in eternity with you? That's the question that every religion is trying to answer. Now let me just say to you, apart from Bible, Christianity, 
Every religion has basically the same answer. Here's what it is. You join our group, you jump through our loop, you keep our mores, our laws, our rules, and maybe, maybe, not for sure, maybe one day when you die, you'll go to nirvana or paradise or you'll get reincarnated and, and so forth and so on. Uh, because they can't promise you that you're going to keep everything the way you ought to, up to snuff, so that you can get to a better place. By the way, that's why Hinduism practices reincarnation. You got a chance to try again. You know, you mess up, you've come back as a frog. You've come back as a mosquito. Or, or if you really, if you really mess up, you'll come back as a seminary president. You know, you're going to pay for your sins then. And, uh, I guarantee you, but. That, that's how pessimistic Hinduism is. You know, everybody thinks, oh, reincarnation. You know, the whole deal of reincarnation, you have to go through hundreds of cycles of this uh, attempt to try to build up enough good karma to get reabsorbed back into the great universal world soul. And you look at 9-11, 2001, what was that all about? That was a religious act. Politics, some. But the Dawah had been declared against the United States. It was called the enemy of Islam. And thereby, if you died in a jihad fighting the enemy of Islam, America, you'd go to paradise. Because Islam would tell you there's nobody that has assurance of salvation. Nobody knows that they've done enough good works, kept the five pillars well enough. Even the prophet Muhammad, they would tell you, wasn't sure. He was happy. But if you die in jihad, you're going to go to, eat, to paradise. So these 19 young Muslim men killed themselves, killed thousands of others in an attempt to fight the great Satan, America. And they believed they were going to go to paradise. That's why two nights before they were out drinking and considering soliciting prostitutes. They thought the prostitutes were too expensive, so they didn't go there. But why would a Muslim young man do that? Because he knew two days later, according to his religion, his sins would be totally forgiven. Because he had died in jihad. That's why it's very important you get the right answer to this question. Not only does your eternity and where you spend it depend upon it, but how you live your life here and now is determined by the answer you have. So these young men, uh, or, or this, this man, went to Jesus. And let me tell you, there's only one religion that breaks the mold, and that's Bible Christianity, which tells us that God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son on the cross for our sins, who died in the place for us, who was raised from the dead, so that when we believe on Him and put our faith in Him, we will not perish but have everlasting life. Amen. Amen. Folks, I know I'm going to heaven. Amen. Not because I'm up here as a preacher. Not because I've been preaching most of my life. Not because I'm a seminary president or married a beautiful Polish lady or anything like that. I know I'm going to heaven because of what Jesus Christ is. Amen. Sometimes I get asked a question or told by folks, you know, you Baptists are so narrow being a Baptist preacher, you think only Baptists are going to heaven. To which I respond by saying, no, we're more narrow than that. We don't even believe all the Baptists are going to make it. <laughs> and I don't believe they're all going to make it. And here's why. Some of them think being a Baptist is going to get you to heaven, and that is not true. It's only when you put your faith and trust in Jesus that you can know Amen. you're good to be with the Lord. Went to the right person, went the right way, got the right uh, asked the right question, number four, got the right answer. Jesus said to him, you know the commandments, do not commit adultery, do not burden, do not steal, do not bear false witness, do not fraud on your father and mother. Now you might be saying, well I thought you just said that salvation is a gift. That's right. But here's the point. You're not going to trust or accept that gift unless you know that you have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Unless you know that your good works aren't enough to get you when you come to that conclusion, then you're going to look to Jesus and His saving work on the cross to save you instead of trying to save yourself. 
And this rich man thought he was still good enough. Oh, Lord, he said, all those things I have kept from my youth up. <laughs> right. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, right. Anybody here? Anybody here uh, confess that? You know? Oh, I've never committed adultery. Well, Jesus said, if you look lustfully after one you have. Yes, right. I've never committed murder. Jesus said, if you hate your heart, you have. Mm. We can go on down the list. Never, never tell a lot. We can just go down the list. Well. And you see, I can stand up here today, knowing very few of you, but I can point to you, each and every one, that, in fact, all of you have sinned and come short of the glory of God. All of you have fallen short of what the, what the Lord wants. Amen? Amen. I love Ron and Vicki. Let me tell you something. They're sinners. <laughs> yeah, we are too. I was in a meeting once and a guy got up afterwards and said, oh, I've never committed a sin. I said, oh, really? Hey, man, I want to meet you. This is an honor. I noticed he had a wedding band on. I said, uh, let me ask you a question. I said, yeah. I said, is your wife here tonight? He said, yeah, she's in the back of the room. Come to lady in the back of the room. I kind of <laughs> And I said, would you bring her up here? And I want her in on this conversation. <laughs> he, said, he said, what? <laughs> I said, I want to ask her a question. What? What question do you want? I want to know if she has the same opinion about you that you have about yourself. But would she agree with you that you have never, ever, ever, ever committed this sin? And he just turned red and walked out. <laughs> End of argument page. All have sinned. So the rich man needed to know that. So Jesus tested him on what we call the second table of the Ten Commandments, the last six that relate to all of our relationship with each other. And you know it's very interesting in there. Jesus actually slips one in that's not a Ten Commandment, which is do not defraud. It's not that's a right. Ten Commandment. That's right. But here's the point. It is a combination of two commands. Do not lie, do not steal. Stealing by lying is the fraud. And Jesus, since he authored the Ten Commandments, will let him as <laughs> way he wants to do that. Because you know why? I think the rich man would have never committed a violent crime, would have never stolen something in a violent way from somebody. But do you think he ever defrauded somebody? Mm -hmm. Do you think he ever you know, cut corners on a deal to make a little padding on the profit he was getting from a trade, a sale, a bargain of some sort, he was kept, probably. And since Jesus knows the heart of all men and doesn't need anybody to testify, knows this from the beginning, I think, he was trying to show this man, you know, I know you better than you know yourself. And I know you need my grace and forgiveness. But, you know, that being the case, Jesus tested him then on the first four. And the first four commandments deal with our relationship to God. And what is the first command? The first command is, Thou shalt have no other gods before me. Now here's a guy who kneels asking Jesus a question only God could answer, calling him good, uh, showing worship and reverence and obeisance to Jesus. So you want to call me God? You want to call me good? You want to kneel? You want to ask me a question? God, okay, let's test you out. Uh, command number one, thou shalt have no other gods before me. Here's what I want you to do. I want you to go sell all that you have and give it to the poor. Now that was the first part of the, of the directive, right? And I think if that's all that Jesus had told him, he would have had a deal. I think the rich man would have got up, gone, gone and sold, liquidated his assets. Why? Well, he's smart. He knows if he did that, he would go to a place for eternity. And guess what? Things are so good up there that we're told they fill potholes with this stuff. <laughs> now in Missouri, we don't fill potholes with anything. <laughs> <laughs> they fill potholes with this stuff, streets of gold. And let me tell you something. 
If that's the answer to how we get into heaven, we would all be well advised and served to go home today, liquidate all of our assets, call our bank, our real estate agent, put it all in cash, write out a big check to Midwestern Baptist Theologian <laughs> and say, Lord, I'm giving it to you, and I want a home in heaven. And then tomorrow, we can start all over. And we can still have ourselves as the center of our little world and our little universe. Donald Trump was bankrupt. He started it. We doing pretty good. Colonel Sanders, KFC, got rich on KFC after uh, going on Social Security. He used to say that God called him to preach, but he chickened out. <laughs> <laughs> so you can start all over again. You can do that. And you can still be living for yourself. And nothing will have changed. And here's what Jesus said. Go sell all that you have. Give it to the poor. Then, come take up the cross and follow me. Now that was the sticker for the rich man. You mean, Lord, I'm supposed to follow you. You're to be the Lord of my life. Yeah, that's right. You see, here's the point. The Bible says, the rich man on hearing, and by the way, isn't it interesting, Jesus said, and the Bible says, looking at him, he loved this man. Mm -hmm. He's not trying to make it hard on him. He wanted this man to have joy, the hope of heaven, purpose in life, a personal relationship with him. He wanted the rich man to have all those things. But he knew that if he was serving the material gods in his life, that wasn't going to be possible. And the Bible says the rich man went away sad because he had great possessions. But here's the point. Not only did he have great possessions, the truth of the matter is his possessions had him. And the point about it is Jesus didn't care one whit about having the man's wealth. Jesus has it all anyway, by the way. You're just borrowing it for the moment. And the point was that Jesus wanted his wealth. He said, go sell it. You have him bring it to me. The son is interesting. Jesus didn't want the rich man's wealth. He wanted the man. He wanted his heart, his life, everything. He said, after you sell what you have, go, take the cross, follow. That was the problem. Went to the right person, went the right way, asked the right question, got the right answer, but made the wrong decision. The Bible says, if you seek your life, you will lose it. But, if you lose your life for my sake, Jesus said, you will find it. That's the whole secret. That's the whole joy. That's the bottom line. Pastor, uh, my pastor back in Kansas City, heard him say this one Sunday. He was asked by some friends of his after he gave his heart to the Lord, what do you have to give up for Jesus? That Jesus? Here's what his answer was. You have to give up everything. But you also have to give up nothing. Because when you give it, give it all to Jesus, you give it all back from Jesus. And the most important you give back is Jesus, who is the way, the truth, and the life. To have and to know the Son, the Bible says, is eternal life. Jesus said, I've come to give you life and to give it more abundantly. To give you the abundant life. So when you give it, Jesus everything, you get everything back. And most importantly, you get Him back as Lord and Master of your life. And you get life from you. Two stories to finish. One is story of a baseball pitcher. I read his obituary in Time Magazine some years ago. Here's what it said. Died Donnie Moore, hard luck baseball pitcher of a self-inflicted gunshot wound to the head. 
after shooting and seriously injuring his wife following an argument in their Anaheim, California. More was released, the obituary said, last month by the Kansas State Royals Farm Day. His life and his career had ended tragically, hoping to rebuild his career. Moore never got over it, went on to say, having given up a home run pitch to Dave Henderson in the American League Championship Series. I read that and I said, what a tragedy. Here's a man who thought that life is contained in how well he throws a five ounce leather sphere 60 feet 6 inches. And when he can't do that anymore to please the professionals, he thinks life is over. It's done. It's finished. Because you see, apparently, that's what he lived for. Now before we're too hard on dying more, though, let's ask ourselves this question. Let me ask you this question. What are you living for? Can you tell me? Well, it's to be a better person, be a good father, be a good husband, be a good citizen, be, you know, live a comfortable life, get through life, enjoy the ride, all this kind of thing. What is the purpose of your existence? Remember what Jesus said? <laughs> Seek your life, you'll lose it. you lose your life for my sake, you'll find it. Because if your life doesn't contain in it that eternal, personal, important dimension of living it for Jesus, of living it for His glory and honor. When it comes to the end of the road, there will be nothing eternal to show for it. However, when you give your life to Jesus, then you find it. That is Another story, just to close, Jim Elliott, young missionary, young wife in his late 20s, newborn baby, killed in the jungles of Ecuador, trying to reach the Aga Indians with the message of the gospel. Good news is that he and his friends who were killed there in the Amazon River Basin later saw those people reached by the efforts of others who followed their example. But Jim Elliott knew the chances of them getting killed were pretty good due to the reputation of the folks they were trying to reach out to and to help. And so he contemplated the reality of his death and his death following the will of Christ. He thought about that verse, you seek your life, you lose it, you lose your life for my sake, you find it. And a few days before he was killed, Jim Elliott wrote in his journal, these words. A man is no fool who gives away what he cannot keep in order to gain what he can never lose. When you give your life to Jesus, you're giving him what you cannot keep. One day it's all over. But when you give your life to Jesus, you get from him what you can never lose which is his life, eternal life, that personal relationship with him, that makes life what life is to be all about. It gives us eternal hope, eternal assurance, and eternal joy in his presence. Let's bow together as we pray. With our heads bowed and our hearts lifted to the Lord. You may be here today, and you've never given your life very easy to do in one way, it's very difficult in another. You have to decide to determine, Lord Jesus, I want you to be my Lord and Savior. I'm going to stop trying to earn my way into heaven. I'm going to stop trying to be good enough. I'm going to trust you, your saving work on the cross for my salvation. It's very easy in one way, very difficult in another. Just to rest and trust in His abiding grace and ask for His salvation. If that's the heart prayer that you had this morning, then in your heart of hearts, pray these words. Lord Jesus Christ, I believe you died for my sins. I believe God raised you from the dead. Come into my heart. Be my Lord. Be my Savior. 
I give my life to you. And if you pray that, believe in him with all sincerity, he'll hear your prayer. Father, we thank you for your great truth and for your wonderful gospel. We ask you to have your way in every heart, in every life this morning. May your Holy Spirit be in control. And may those here without Christ trust him as Lord and Savior. Those with Jesus, help us to daily pick up our cross and follow you. We pray, we ask you, in Jesus' name, amen. You know, I'm so thankful for Dr. Roberts coming and giving this message today. I want to, as the team closes this service and we just worship our way out of here today, first of all, if you said that prayer for the very first time, I'm going to be right back there in the back. I'd love for you to come up and say, Ron, I received Christ today. I want to rejoice with you and I want to give you some material that will help you on that journey. But before we close, I'd like us, as we just worship in song together, I'm going to ask the ushers if they would. I just want us to just give our hearts out and just show our appreciation for Dr. Roberts coming. I'd like to, I'd like to take a love offering for him and and just let him know how much we appreciate what all he does for for us behind the scenes and coming out today to be with us. So I'm going to turn it over to the team. We're going to sing together. The ushers are going to come. And then we're just going to, at the end of the song, just say, Glory be to God. May be glorified in all things. And tonight at 6 o'clock, we hope to see you for an hour for our prayer communion service. It will be an awesome time in the Lord together. God bless you all.